from hearing that so far? Do you have some questions about perhaps some of those policy positions or those reputations? Good. religion 
prejudices people against the truth of the gospel. If Jesus Christ had to die for my sins because I'm guilty, and if I can't get to heaven unless I trust him as my Savior, then when I say to you, I know I'm going to heaven, it's not because I think for a minute I deserve to go there. It's because I've trusted the one who said he would give me a home in heaven if I would trust him. Understanding that gospel changes how people perceive of a Christian witness. I'm not saying I'm in because I'm really good and you're not in because you're not as good as me. I'm saying nobody's in good. But God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for all of us. He paid for my sin and your sin so we don't have to. The only difference would be I took the payment and some of you haven't taken the payment. You're going to try and work it out yourself or hope there isn't a heaven. It doesn't seem like well, much of a hope. Right. 
idea. He had the right. So it's still justification by faith alone. He saw it in the scripture, but when he saw it, he drew back from it because it was more than he could. It was more than he could embrace. How could God accept a sinner on the sole basis of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? There's got to be something I have to do to merit His favor. He was still holding on to enough of that. He taught what was correct, he taught what was correct, but he couldn't practice it. And then his followers, they took up arms and went to war to fight the Catholic Church for control of the state. And so, religious wars. Yes. And so that's why when our founding fathers came over here, they were very specific and they were very vague. They talked about providence. Because they didn't want to use a term that a Lutheran would seize upon, or a Congregationalist would seize upon, or a Calvinist or a Catholic would seize upon, because they wanted you to be able <coughs> to be a Jehovah's Witness if you wanted to be, or a Mormon if you want, not that there were, those things existed then, but however you want to worship God, we're going to leave you alone, unless you're a Jew. There was evolution. So then... Roger Williams goes down to Rhode Island, and, and, and Tor Torino follows him down there and founds the first synagogue. So it's really interesting. If you ever get to go to Providence, Rhode Island, picture downtown Deland. And over there is the first Baptist church started in America. Over here is the first regular Baptist church started in America. And right over there is the first synagogue ever started in America. They're within three blocks of each other. Because Roger Williams is like, you know what? We came over here so we can worship how we wanted to worship. You guys are driving me out of town because they won't worship your way. This is not the idea. So, so there has always been the struggle in the book of Acts. You read about it. As soon as they're preaching Christ, people believe on Jesus Christ, and a little church gets started. Here come the religious people and try to wage war against it and shut it down. So, when, when we're out here, I've been, like I said, I've been out here since 1985. And one of you was going to ask if your professor required you to ask questions. Do you think this does any good? Or what do people say? And here's what they say. I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you the most common thing that people say. I'm a Christian and I don't think you should be doing this. It's never, I'm a devil and I don't think you should be doing this. I'm an atheist and I don't think you should be doing this. I'm a Muslim and I don't think you should be doing this. It's always, I'm a Christian. Stop doing what Christians have always done because I don't want to do it. It's embarrassing me. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, every prophet preached God's word in public to people who didn't ask to hear it. Jesus Christ and his disciples in the Gospels preached the word of God in public to people who didn't ask to hear it. In the book of Acts, everywhere they went, they preached the Gospel in public to people who didn't want to hear it. So, this is practicing biblical evangelical Christianity. The idea is not sit in your church and wait for people to come to you or offer them spaghetti and a rock band and see if you can trick them into coming. The idea is, here's what we've got. And it's well understood that everybody doesn't want this. How is that the measure of anything? And here, here's a fair, honest question. This man, Downtown Music, he has been here as long as I've been here. And this is for the Championship Store has been here almost as long as I've been here. Do you know how many tens of thousands of people drive by those doors every week and never stop? Because they're not interested. You know why they're open? So when someone who drives by who is looking for old 33 and 3rd LPs, or somebody who needs their shoe repair says, oh, there's where I can find what I'm looking for. 
So the reason Christians go out into the world to preach the gospel is not with the expectation that the whole world is going to be converted. It's so when someone passes by who says, you know what, I'm tired of my addictions, I'm tired of my depression, I'm tired of my guilt, I'm tired of my confusion, there's somebody who's offering me some hope and offering me life, let me stop and talk to them. Okay? So, let's, let's try this from a business model. When we started, well, from the time we started to today, our church membership has increased. If you just count the people who are here, not the other people who have gone from our church to start other churches, to start churches on the mission field, just within our church building, we have had a growth of 3,300%. No restaurant at the land has had that kind of growth. No business in that, in, in that time period has had that kind of growth. So we're not out here for numbers. This idea that if you do this, you're just going to drive people away, it's not going to do any good. Question. Someone who is right now living in Jacksonville, and I'm standing right here, how can I drive them anywhere? If they were here, I could drive them away. They're not here. If someone walking by has no interest in God, I'm not driving them away. They're away. They're already away. The sign says Olive Garden, so that someone who is driving by without a care in the world will suddenly be reminded, I could get meatballs. <laughs> An unlimited salad. Let's pull in. So the purpose is not to force the world to become a Christian or, you know, and we hear this all the time. I don't think you should be shoving things down people's throats. That would first of all be illegal. It would be very hard to do. And I don't know anybody who's ever done that. How could you shove the gospel down someone's throat? Let's say, uh, you know, it's free, it's available, it's here. If you want it, fine. If you don't want it, you keep walking. Yeah, yeah. So free act, free act of faith. And we started this thread with uh, thinking about that German who began the movement in this direction toward justification by faith alone. And by an act of providence, at that very moment, a colleague from Germany stepped up. This is Peggy Hasen, <laughs> who comes to us from Freiburg, Germany, is visiting. And welcome to you. And if, if you don't have any questions yourself, please do jump in. You have, you, have to, you have to elbow out all these folks. Okay, so, so what you have is, you have 2,000 years of biblical Christianity, unchanged. People who believe in Jesus Christ gather together, they sing hymns, they pray, they hear preaching from the Bible, they meet each other's needs, they bear each other's burdens. They go out into the world and they tell people about Jesus. That's what, that's what they did in the book of Acts. That's what they did all through history, all over the world. That's what we do here in the land. Now, alongside that, you have sacramental and state churches. They're about property and territory and political power and armies and wars. And because of that, what happens is when you go to college and learn about the history of Western civilization, you read about the Christians going on crusades to take the Holy Land back from the Muslims. Those weren't Christians. Those were Roman Catholics. It was an army. It was a political movement. It was a state church trying to force people to belong to their church where another group had forced them to belong to their church or their religion. We're not part of that, we were never part of that. Luther was part of that and came part way out. But but off that track, there has always been biblical Christianity. Luther didn't rediscover the Bible. Luther just decided to read it. It had been there all along. Luther didn't find out there was a God who saved by grace. He personally found that God would save him by grace. So these are not these are not new things or things that started with 
one man here on the timeline or here on the timeline. This is the same gospel message that's been preached right along from the beginning of time. So, we already have time for some questions? Hello, good to see you. Do you have some questions? Um, I grew up a Episcopalian, which is a very, you know, sacramental, yeah. so basically Protestant Catholic. So and, um, uh, I was just wondering, do you think that those sacraments have value in any way, or are they just kind of like okay. offer shit? Let, let's, well, <laughs> let, let's, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament. Here. Here's a tabernacle and later a temple. Here's a priest. And there's two men standing in line, and each of them has a lamb that they're bringing to sacrifice. One man is bringing that lamb, and he's saying, I hope this is good enough to buy God. I hope God will be so impressed with this, and he'll forgive my sins. The other man knows, how could I buy off the creator of the heavens and the earth with an animal? God can't be that hard up for an offering or sacrifice. So one man is hoping the sacrifice is going to take his The other man has trusted the grace and mercy of God to forgive him. And he's bringing that sacrifice to say to God, thank you. This is the most valuable thing I have. I want to give it to you. Thank you. Fast forward to the New Testament. In our church, the first Sunday of every month, we said, take bread, drink the cup, and we do it, as the Bible says, in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. I can't be saved by not drinking that cup. I can't be saved by drinking that cup. I'm not a better Christian if I drink it. I'm not a worse Christian if I drink it. Now, someone else might come to the very same church service and say, if I eat this bread, God's going to owe me forgiveness for sin. If I drink this cup, God's going to give me a home in heaven. So two people are doing the same thing. One is doing it hoping that their good works are going to save them, and they can. The other is doing it out of devotion or worship toward God, thanking Him because they've already been saved. You can put in there any work that you want to, saying prayers, coming out and witnessing and telling people about Jesus. What religion wants to do, it wants to put a cart here. It wants to bring a horse around and have the horse push the cart. If you do these good works, you'll get to go to heaven. What God says is, trust me, I'll give you a home in heaven, and then you can get in front of that cart and do some good works. So, if you're trying to get to heaven by the sacraments of your church, you're never going to get there. And what the proof of that is, Roman Catholic Church holds out as the hero of the age is Mother Teresa. As soon as Mother Teresa died, they started saying masses for her to get her out of her. If Mother Teresa didn't go to heaven when she died, then there's no merit to us with this happened. So, by their own admission, these works can't earn the eternal life. If you will be saved by good works, then there would be no reason for Jesus. To die on the cross. He died on the cross because there is no other way for our sins to be forgiven. Uh, the Episcopal Church is the Catholic Church that got out of paying dues to the Pope. says, or the priest says, or the synod says, or the, the 
the elders say, what does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? So we would always go back to the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. To which, one Stetson student will say, the Bible is just written by men. To which I would say, everything you've ever read in your life was written by men. Why do you only have that prejudice against one book? It's not a prejudice, it's the truth. What is the truth? That it was written by men. Well, of course it was written by men. It yeah. didn't write itself. Yes, and so that it's no big deal. The big deal is that those men wrote under the inspiration of God and recorded God's words for man. You know, we need to get so clear. So the difference you can be up just a little bit. Make it this way, but I've it behind. There are books written by men to set forth their ideas about God, and there is a book that God wrote to reveal Himself to man. And so we choose to follow the Bible and to judge all the other books by the Bible rather than judge the Bible by the other books. And you'll have to make that choice for yourself. Everybody will. What's going to be the authority in your life? Yeah. A website, blog by some person you've never met, or the Holy Bible that has stood against all opposition for 2,000 years without proven error, written by men who really and truly died for their faith and their belief in what they wrote. We came across the, the idea in our class about Biblical literalism, remember that? Oh, yeah. Uh, biblical literalism. Is, is that a fair term for the, the, the approach to Christianity that you... How do you mean that term? That, I, well, I think in the last three you said something down. The simplest rule for reading the Bible is everything that can be taken literally should be taken literally. Okay. If the Bible says Jesus sat in a boat, it's a boat. If the Bible says that boat was sitting upon the Sea of Galilee, it's the Sea of Galilee. It doesn't picture a leaf floating in a cloud. It's, it's a boat on a sea. If Jesus says, consider the lilies, you don't, I wonder what he means by lilies. Well, they don't toil, they don't spin, but they're beautiful flowers. I get it. It's a beautiful flower. So we don't subject the Bible to our imagination or to our interpretation. We just allow it to mean what it says. If Je the Bible says Jesus Christ was crucified at Jerusalem and they drove nails in his hands and his feet, then we don't argue or debate where he died and how he died. That's what it says. Yeah. So, a lot of biblical literalism, people generally use the term biblical literalism, especially to refer to creation. creation. What, what kind of position do you espouse about creationism with the Genesis you know, first chapter of the Bible? We take that very little. That's little. Yeah. So 6,000 year old history of the world. No. So see, please see, correct me. Again, this, this is where other professing Christians yeah. have made things difficult. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches that God is eternal. The Bible teaches that God has been very busy dealing with worlds and creations and angels and cherubim and planets for eternity. 6,000 years ago, God made man on this earth. So we believe in a very old earth, in a very young human race. Oh, okay. So there's a distinction there's, that other evangelicals do. Yes. They, they talk about 6,000 for the whole thing. And this whole is thing. where they get in trouble. Okay. Because they're, they're literal on parts of the Bible, like right. the Genesis account. Yeah. But they're not literal on parts of the Bible like Satan predating Adam or angels predating Adam. And so now they get themselves in a bind. Which is what you, which they, is what this church is about. They're, well, the Satan predates, yeah, because otherwise you're locked into this 6,000 year history of God, and the history of God in the Bible goes way back before Adam. Now, if you're talking about um, creation in the sense of man, since there is no evidence for, for anything ever being something other than a man and giving birth to something that was a man. Mm -hmm. 
we're not going to call that science. We're going to call that a faith or a belief system. So evolution. Darwin had a right. faith and a belief system. So Darwinism has a faith system that parallels sure. faith systems of sure. religions. Sure. So yes. again, you're choosing one faith or another. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people say, well, nobody was there for creation. Nobody was there when two apes said, what is that? <laughs> when a human baby came up. So, so it's 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 faith on both parts, but it's basically one yeah. yeah. But here's what here's what you got to consider with Darwin. Most people who, who espouse Darwin's theory of evolution have never been honest enough to read Darwin's book. Anybody here ever read Darwin's Origin of Species? Do you know do you know that Darwin wrote extensively that blacks and Latinos were links between apes and humans? <laughs> they were not humans. <laughs> you still want to hold the Darwin spirit up. <laughs> Darwin called that females would never have the mental <clears throat> capability to be equal with men and to dwell equally in society with men. <clears throat> now how Darwin is held up as a hero on college campuses that are all about equality shows it's a religious faith that people are clinging to because they don't want to believe the Bible. I mean, Darwin, if Darwin was properly taught, he'd be an embarrassment at Stetson. No, no African American, no Latina, no woman would want anything to do with Darwin. So, and, and before I became a Christian, I was just me. And I remember sitting in junior high, listening to the teacher talk about Neanderthal and Lucy and cro and the rest of the band. And, and here's what seemed really odd to me. For 500 million years, we got monkey, 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 ape, 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 ape. And then one day, out of out of all these hundreds of millions of years, this man and this woman have a baby. And this baby's like, somehow the genes got to be uh, Let's start becoming human. You'd think the other genes would say, what's a human? But they didn't. So the genes got together and they produced this thing that was like half man, half ape. Okay, let's say that happened. I've got to believe that out of all those hundreds of millions of years, in the very same place, at the very same time, two other apes had one of those that was of the other gender, and those two got together at homecoming and made a baby, and we got the human race. That, I'm sorry, I don't have that much faith. That is really, really out there. Here's what else I wonder when I go to the, to the museums. Think how disappointed you would be. Just, just a second. Think how disappointed you would be. It's year 400 million BC. Four zero 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 zero, and you're almost, you're just about to evolve into something else. You're going to be a walking whale or a, a flying horse or something, and you're almost there. And then the calendar turns got to wait a hundred million years to evolve because nothing ever evolves on a year that doesn't have six zeros in it. It's like, how disappointing is this? I was almost there and now I got to wait a hundred million years because everything in the museum evolved on some hundred million year line. Because it's not specific at all. Because you don't trust it. They've carbon dated outboard motors at 10,000 years old. <laughs> so we've talked in this class about trust. So what? No wait, because no, because carbon dating. Let, let's be fair. We took a group of young people like yourselves to the Smithsonian <coughs> Museum in Washington D.C. Hardly an evangelical Christian outfit. And in the Museum of National History, they're showing a movie. And this movie is about how the black bears that lived. Alaska, Canada, they couldn't catch the Arctic foxes or the little Arctic bunny rabbits because the little white foxes and the little white, ra white rabbits saw the big black bear coming and they hid. I'm not making this up. 
So the narrator tells us through the wonders of evolution, the genes inside these black bears got together and said, let's make our coat white. So we can sneak up on the little Arctic fox and sneak up on the little Arctic bunny. And over the next 200 million years, the black bear evolved into the polar bear. To which one of our eighth graders said, how did they live 200 million years when they couldn't catch food? <laughs> That's faith. You believe that by faith. You have no proof for that. It hasn't. They, they, saw, they saw 200 million years of evolution. Who saw 200 million years of evolution? You did? Yeah.